my name is Ryan Pion. I am uh, a first AC in the local 600 for over 25 years now. Um, and I enjoy what I do. And I'm going to just, I guess, uh, uh, sort of give my take on, on what I do and how I do it. And my name is Jason Kinney, uh, local 600 also, uh, mm -hmm. 26 years experience, film loading, seconding, now first AC work, uh, digital. Seen a lot of changes in the industry over 26 years, and we'll see. I'm sure there's going to be plenty more. To come. This is just our opinions and how we do our jobs. There is no real wrong or right way to do something, but it's how we've done it. And, and um, you know, there's obviously so many factors involved in, in you know, uh, being a first AC and what gear you're using. And we'll try to cover some of that today as best we can. You're going to pick and choose how you like to do things. There's so many different ways to do it. And as far as we're concerned, anybody, as long as it's done, it's, it doesn't matter how it's done. So you'll, you'll watch people as you go on from show to show, and you'll pick up different, oh, you know, like I said, like different carts. I like this one because it's shorter, this one's taller. A bag you pick compared to like a Pelican case, and just how you organize things. But people don't really, or we don't really micromanage that stuff. It's like, you, as long as it's done, we're happy, and that's, and that's it. You know, first, there's getting the job, whether it's getting a call from an assistant who's already working on a show, or meeting up with a DP, or you know, I've had UPMs contact me for jobs and, and that sort of thing, where you, once you get the job, you're really working heavily with, obviously, the cinematographer. And um, you're trying to understand the show and seeing what they want to do and working with them on not only cameras and lenses but a lot of little logistical things that they you're sort of hired to troubleshoot or you, you know give your input and i think you know as uh, if you do this the best thing is is to give your input and give your thoughts um i find the more communication you have with uh with uh, cinematographers and directors and pretty much everyone in production things go more more smoothly I think also as you're just starting out, the number one thing is networking. Now it's easier nowadays with the phone, you just send a text, but really just send a text, hey, I'm available, because if when you get on a show and you, you know, you're kind of out of sight, out of mind, if I, if I don't hear from somebody, I assume they're working. If you're not, you know, so it's every once a month, every couple of weeks, just, hey, I'm, I'm available if you need me, you know, just a nice simple text and you know, they'll respond, okay, you know, We'll see what's coming up or whatever, but really not be super aggressive, but be aggressive enough that people know that you're around if you're looking for work. You're always looking for your next job. Yeah. You know, you can't depend on one certain person or, you know, uh, uh, you're, you're hustling to find. It's not a nine to five job. You don't have a yearly contract. There's a reason we're paid hourly and weekly is because it does come to an end and that can be a little you know, a, a little uh, worrisome at first, but once you network, like you said, it's, it's the people you're sitting next to here could possibly be the people you're working with uh, in six months. I, I think after you sort of figure out your project, the first thing you do is figure out the cameras and the lenses. And one of the things I find is the industry, when Jason and I both started, we were doing film. There was film, a 35 millimeter camera, and a 35 millimeter lens. Nowadays, there's so much to choose from, from formats and lenses. There, there's twice as many lenses now, and uh, there's not a uniform sort of system. Uh, the sizes of chips matter, and the types of the diameters of the lenses, how fast they are, their close focus. So as you start to work with a DP more and you say you find a project, you have to keep th things like that in mind as well as to how are they going to shoot the show? Is it a heavy handheld? Is there a lot of steady cam? You know, are you shooting in tight spaces? Maybe you can't shoot anamorphic because of the, the focus. You know, there's lots of things to sort of uh, uh, keep them abreast of. And, and a good DP will obviously, uh, you know, keep those things in mind. But there, there's been occasions where a, a cinematographer will want this lens on that camera in this format, and you basically have to tell them that's not going to work. It's going to vignette, or they want that format, but hey, if you do high speed, you're not going to get that. So I think one of the big things for me is really staying abreast um, on new technology and new lenses and what's coming out. I think that's doing research and joining a couple of Facebook groups that talk about things really helps out. Also learning all the different cameras. You know, you got the Arri LF, you got the Mini, you got the Sony Venice, 
you got black magic, you've got Canon 5Ds, always to know as much as you can because you never know what show you're gonna go on, you're never gonna know what they have, and if you go in there and you know, you know the black magic and somebody else doesn't, you might, they might call you in and say, hey, oh, you know, he, Jason knows the black magic and we can set him up on a stunt and he can rig a couple and he knows all the formats and he knows how to change everything. So try and learn as much as you can, especially if you're on a show. There shouldn't be a piece of equipment on the show that you're on that you shouldn't know. And don't be afraid to ask. The, the one rule I have is the only stupid question is the one you didn't ask. Don't assume. I, you know, uh, I had somebody years ago assume and the piece of equipment was wrong and now I was really upset. He was like, oh, I didn't want to ask because I didn't want to sound stupid. It's like, well, now I'm really mad because I could have solved that problem if you had come to me and said, hey, I think this is missing instead of like, well, I don't know. I don't want to look, you know, I don't want to look stupid. And it really cost us in that day and it cost me a lot of time to like fix the problems. I think, you know, knowing the ins and outs of the camera obviously very important. The more like workshops you can go to like this and learn not just, you know, touch, you really get into the menus. Uh, there's really no set way on, on uh, how they do things, but again, that, that whole format thing and knowing, you know, there's constant stuff, uh, information on the internet as far as to speeds and that sort of thing and how, um, you know, uh, what cameras can do what, but to be able to go in and change all that kind of stuff, it, you know, takes, and, and, and most, most cinematographers are worried about so many other things, they expect you to do that. But the more you can, uh, you can really, you know, study those things, I think uh, really benefits uh, for a first AC. You know, it, it constantly changes in different, for, like you said, different formats. Yeah. One show might be 4K, one show might be back in HD. You know, you never know what you're going to get. From there, as far as what, once you've sort of got those things figured out and you know the show and what's sort of where, where you're shooting and, and how you're shooting, you've agreed on stuff, you know, we'll commonly go to uh, a, one of the major rental houses and we'll, we'll prep those cameras. And one of the things you will find with assistants, whether you know, you're a director or you're a first or a second, no two, two assistants build a camera the same way. There, there are literally thousands of combinations of gears and monitor, or gear and monitors and, and you know, focusing equipment, where they put it, how they put it, you learn from each other. You say, oh, I don't like that, or I do like that. So it's always good to go to a new show and see how someone does something, or they have a new piece of gear, or even as something simple as a little mount, you'd be like, oh, that would be yeah. handy. The prep is really good, too, when you're the utility second. That's your organization time. If you're a utility, it kind of gives you a chance to like look at how the piece of equipment comes in the case. And you can kind of make, take a mental picture. So next time you get that piece of equipment, you open the case, you're like, I thought there was something in that, you know, there's a hole there. Why isn't there something there? Or, you know, last second, you got to kind of make sure you got everything. So that's a good mental picture of what you need. I always look at it like building the camera mentally. So I, I start the spreaders, I go to the sticks, I go to the head, the camera, the lens, the map box, and then like media and batteries. And before we go anywhere, I'm always just mentally, you know, I'm looking at it. Okay, I'm building it. Okay, I've got that. I've got that. I've got that. Okay, we're good to go. Yeah. And that just comes with a lot of experience, but the prep is, especially when you're learning, it gives you a chance to ask questions and really look at the, the first step. Most of the shows we work on, it's multiple millions of dollars worth of gear. And a simple cable is going to be, if you lose that, is $200, $300. So keeping things organized and labeling things. Uh, you will commonly see cameras coded in colors you know, representing, you know, which camera is where and every little cable. Yeah. And it seems excessive, but it's also for, if a day player comes in, he knows red goes to red. It, it's really almost like a military approach or, you know, from the way cases are labeled, uh, bright colors and everything. So we know that if for some reason we're not there for a day or someone, you know, new is there, you know, that organizing of gear is, is a huge part from labeling every battery to, to doing that. And then at the end of a six, nine month show, you don't want to talk to a you know, production manager and say, we're missing this and this. Try to get as much prep as possible. And <clears throat> commonly they'll say, you don't need that much time. It's like, yeah, well, it helps. The more organized we are, the smoother things run when we start a show. So I feel asking for a substantial amount of prep. I mean, that also allows a, a DP to do tests. Uh, filters is another thing you're going to want to maybe check out. What does the DP want to shoot? Does he want to do a full ward or costume um, 
um, test and, and see, see what happens. Can you give them the hierarchy of your guys' department from either bottom to top or top to bottom? <laughs> Technically, my boss would be the, the cinematographer. Um, sometimes uh, uh, a operator is in that position. So usually the DP will talk with Ryan and then Ryan will talk with me and then we'll get, go out to the seconds and the utilities and the DIT, this is what we're doing. You know. You're on set minimum of 12 hours a day and, and you have to get along, you have to enjoy the people, you have to enjoy your job. Ne it's never going to be perfect, there's going to be rough days and tough locations or, or, or whatever it is, but, but being, you know, it, it's, it's getting along with everyone and communicating with everyone. And just in general, then also for a shot, it's important to, you know, some of you are operators, so you'll do something, I wanna know what you're doing. You know, you, you, you've operated your, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna swing over there. And communication between the two of us will make a better shot. If I see something and be like, hey, hey, I don't know if you saw because you were down you were down here, but they did something. Swing up and catch them, and I'll rack to them, and you'll get that extra bonus. And the director will be, oh, that was great. Do that again. And those little sort of no. crumbs make you be like, oh, that was great. So communicating between an operator and a first is really important. Communicating and and collaborating is is one of the reasons I enjoy coming to work. As far as gear goes, um, uh, the, the technical side. Uh, Again, we talked briefly about resolutions. Um, I guess know your platform would be my, my first thing. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're streaming online, there, you know, while there is a need for 12K, there is no need to record in 12K. Each network is different. You go on one show on one network and they're HD, and then you go on another show on the same network and they're 4K. You also have to remember that the higher the resolution, the, the more information there is, the more cards you're going to use. And on any camera budget that you will ever look at from any rental house, your single largest line item will be your cards. Yeah. And they cost, the, your cards for two cameras will cost more than the two cameras themselves. At least the rental, I should say. And there's also downloading time. I mean, a um, so. two Teradek card at 8K could take an hour and a half, two hours. We have loaders that take it back home and finish it off. In some shows, if they're heavy visual effects, you're, you're gonna wanna shoot yeah. at least 4K, if not more. Again, there is no, set way to pull focus, but the, the wireless focus system is, if I had to guess, I'd say 90, 95% is the, the industry standard, is pulling wirelessly. Uh, so you have a wireless transmitter, we don't have one on this camera, uh, and you will send it out to the DIT, the director's village, and then we'll have personal focus pulling stations that we pull on. We usually pull on a slightly smaller 13-inch monitor and then um, the, the sort of the last part of the puzzle is um, range finders or uh, distance finders. It, it's a tool, it's yeah. an added tool. It gives you a distance and that sort of thing. And, and especially nowadays, sh sh shooting wide open, uh, I'll take any, any help I can yeah. get. Some people laugh at, at this and that and, and do it, but it's, it's how you want to do it. Some, you know, it, it's certainly different if you're operating and pulling focus yourself, if you're shooting a, a comedy that shoots, that, that uh, you know, doesn't shoot wide open and isn't really edgy, if you're shooting, you know, it, it depends on the show too, but usually we'll put, put something on to aid us. And, yeah. and there are several different, different systems. I have a 13 inch monitor, I always bring that on every show because it just, it just gives me a little sense of, okay, this is, because you're gonna, you don't really necessarily almost always know what you're gonna get, especially if you're covering somebody on main unit, they may have a different monitor than you have. So for me, it's just a little comfort level. It's like, okay, yeah. I feel good. I got my monitor, I know my settings. I'm not trying to play with somebody else's settings. It's a budgetary thing yeah. too. Like uh, I, I own most of this gear or, uh, with, with people or myself and um, it, it's, it's not cheap, these systems but it does give you a comfort level when you're going in. It's certainly not to someone I would say jump right into, right. but, but they, they cost more than a car, some of these <laughs> systems. And, and it's, you know, you don't always get it on rental. They're, they're, sometimes you get them on box rental or you can rent it through the camera house or something like that. But having that sort of, it's almost like a, a whoopee, a blanket of some sort that you know, like, okay, I could do this. I just put my <laughs> stuff on that camera and I can do this, you know, 200 millimeter walk up or something like that you kind of develop your own system and then you, you work from that. And so look at what's out there when you're, when you're on a set, see how no. someone's doing something. 
pick up their good points and what yeah. you don't like and and if you're if you're a first look at how the operator setting is set right. up not only so you can help him but so you can learn the more you know about every other one's jo everyone else's job mm -hmm. uh, or try to understand and learn from it not do it for them or tell them how but i i think that makes you a better assistant always learn how everything on the show works because people look at that they see oh he's learning or she's learning this instead of sitting back playing wordle on the phone you know it's like you know you're kind of taking it in and you're kind of learning by osmosis and this stuff takes time i mean op operating point focus sec seconding slating the more you do it the better you get the more comfortable you get the basic setting up of a camera uh you look at the main you got the camera body uh you're going to put a lens on the Next thing you'll look onto is if you're gonna go wireless focus. Uh, we didn't have any plates here, so we zip tied this. This is the wireless focus um, uh, MDR3 is from Preston, and that's kind of an industry standard right now. And that links up to two of the motors, one for iris and the other one for focus. There's another motor, you know, for you for focus. So some people will mount those on the bottom, some people will mount them on the top off of a top rod system, some will do them on the side. So you'll wire that up uh, where I mean, you could put this MDR. Some people put it on the side, on the back. There's lots of different options as to, as to where. And that obviously goes to uh, the focus hand unit. So this guy's got three channels. So it, actually it has four channels, but it's got a mo you can put a zoom motor, an iris yep. motor, and a zoom motor. So if you're on a crane on the, with a zoom, you'll have the you, ability you to wirelessly to zoom. And, and then we'll commonly d uh, dump off uh, our iris. We have another, I don't have it here, but another miniature handset that we give to the cinematographer so he can do the iris. So we pull the iris out of our hands and give it to him so he can adjust it on the fly or set the shot up. Um, and this also will run the camera. Yes, so you're it has wireless cable, run. So you're, on, you're 60 feet in the air on the crane. I can be down here and I can hit, I can roll the camera down here. You don't have to come down then go back up. And then as far as map boxes go, there's lots of different, I prefer clip-ons like this. Uh, there are studio map boxes, and I think considered studio would be mounted to a rod system. And there are, you know, six by and four by fives. You generally want to try to keep the ca camera, my, my feeling is you want to keep the camera compact. Uh, nowadays we slam two cameras together to get two sides, or we put them in tight locations. So getting the camera as compact as you can you know, is, is they always show pictures of cameras when they first come out and they look so nice and small. Mm -hmm. But by the time we add all our stuff, our cinematographers are always like, you, you know, you ruined the camera, it's so big. <laughs> and I was like, well, do you want wireless iris? Do you want these things? Yeah. Do you want, you know, video transmission? So video transmitter isn't on here, uh, usually with the size of a deck of cards, maybe a little yeah. bit bigger. Um, and that can transmit up to five different uh, um, receivers. In the comment. Usually you see three to one systems, one transmitter, three receivers, like I said, on a focus station, a DIT, and uh, like a director's village. And anything outside of there, you'll either um, hardwire from the DIT or uh, the DIT may have um, uh, wireless transmission of that to iPads and stuff like that. Um, and then the, one of the other things is the this is the Preston Light Ranger. It is a <coughs> focus range finding system. And that works strictly and solely with their wireless focus system. Again, I think this is becoming an industry standard. Um, I've been using it for quite some time now, um, mm -hmm. and I see more and more of them on set. Uh, and basically what that does, this is a, it takes, a rangefinder will give you numbers, obviously. So it'll shoot out and it'll tell you whatever it's looking at is 12 feet away. Uh, and then you would correspond to matching that on your ring. What this does is actually put a graphic overlay to that. What this does is send out an ultraviolet or ultra ultraviolet flash or light, and then the lasers pick up on that. It's a visual representation of the depth of field. So as as people moving and your depth of field is moving, the bars will move. So you'll sit back and you know you'll see <laughs> like you'll start seeing the bars moving. So it's like. Okay, something's happening here. Either the actor's moving, the dolly's moving, the camera's moving. So, so it gives you a little, you yeah, know. Set up properly. But so that's saying like these three lasers are, are now on you. And then I would, I would, you know, I need to set that up better so they're yeah. more. But once it's set up, it, it'll actually go green. Yeah. And that uh, tells you that you're in, you're in the depth of field zone. So you basically want to keep whatever you're focusing on, you want to keep the green bars yeah. on. 
Uh, and this is, this is, like I said, this is pretty much becoming the standard on sets yeah. nowadays. Hard marks, even marks in general, we'll put them down for lighting for the cinematographers sort of light yeah. their, put, put the lights around. Um, but I haven't really gotten hard marks in a while. I will on really, really tricky shots. And then sometimes we'll have a second AC call them out on a mm -hmm. walkie. He'll, he'll do a cadence, he'll do 20 and 15 and 10. And I'll actually, you know, do it still wirelessly, but do it on, uh, do it no, on no, that. Like, oh, you'll be on a close up and someone's walking in, they'll say, pan to the right and pick up the person walking in. <laughs> well, I didn't know I was gonna do that, so I don't have those marks. So this really helps you do that. You basically yeah. just, we it call helps it kind of playing the video game. You're just keeping them in the green. Is it, and it's nice because as you get closer, the bar, the bar moves, so you're like, okay, I gotta go full farther, and then you, gotta, you just keep moving. The idea of cutting <laughs> has kind of gone away. Yeah. They will reset and not cut. So even if you need a mark and you didn't get it, uh, the second we went to digital and cameras can do from 30 minutes to two hours, we commonly yeah. it just keep the cameras rolling. So the ability even to go out and get a mark and be like, oh, if they're gonna do it again, you gotta race out there while the camera's still rolling. So it just, it kind of speeds things up. You, you trust but verify it. So I'll keep the green bars a little low in the, you can adjust the brightness of them. So I'll still, I'll calibrate it, I'll do it. And then I'm still looking at the eyes because sometimes, and it's a little tricky too, because the lasers, not necessarily the one that's in the, in the middle of the face is the one that's reading the eyes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, it's like over here. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you just play with. And I'll sit there like before the take and I'll be like, okay, which laser is, is, the eye, is hitting the eyes? Because some people will just go to the one in the face and it's totally soft. The last, the last line of defense is if, if it looks yeah. soft, do not trust yeah, you, yeah, anything you except your eye yeah. on that monitor and you have sole responsibility. Yeah. So, and, and everyone else on the set does. They see, they'll, they'll know if you're, you're, you have a soft shot. You will know right then. It yeah. used to be 24 hours later, <laughs> but yeah. you will know instantly that you're soft. As far as, you know, setting up, um, you know, it's just how, what makes you comfortable and what work systems you use and what the project is. Uh, one of the things I, I think is important is like, like keeping camera compact as best you can, but also having the ability to switch it out. And there's so many plate options and stuff now for steady cam and handheld. You want this camera to be able to strip the top off or whatever it is and be able to jump to a steady cam or put a handheld rig on that or put it on a crane or whatever it is. You want the ability to do things as quick as you can. And, and that's, that's also something at prep, you would get extra plates and, and sort of those things, you know, okay, this whole thing slides off, we lose the eyepiece for steady cam, we put on a steady cam plate <coughs> and put on steady cam, it's good to go. So it's everything under five minutes is, is the ideal situation. Obviously some cameras are better suited for certain things. Some are bigger, some are smaller. So, and then weight starts to become an issue. You start looking at, you know, do I need carbon rods? Do I need, you know, clip-ons instead of studios? And then some shows you'll have a, a body that's just on the Steadicam or just on the Ronin that you've kind of like, you've taken everything off and it's just solely dedicated for that. And that helps out in time. You don't have to take all the cages off, all this stuff. It's just, it's on there full time, slide it on. It's all set up and and go. I wanted to have you talk about um, lens etiquette. Uh, if you could show how you guys, best practices for changing lenses in the middle of the chaos. Ah, the general rule of thumb is, well, there's always a verbal <laughs> communication yeah. with that, but um, pretend the, the port tab's back there. Uh, yeah, um, you're generally supposed to hand off the lens wide open and in, at infinity. And you always want to put it yeah, you, yeah. Like, face down. Face so. down. I catch it like this, not on the side because yeah, hot day really. or whatever, my hand could slip and the lens could fall out. So you're and then when I, I treat it, when I give it to him, I do the I same hand, way. It's hand, always down. Now I'll, I'll actually ask for my lenses. I usually keep my motors on one side. I'll actually ask for my lenses wide open uh, uh, at minimum. And the reason behind that is when they're telling you to rush, 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 every time a lens goes on, I have to cycle and calibrate it. So I'm putting it on and then, yeah, so I'm cycling the motor. Now, if I set it at, at uh, minimum, I've uh, removed one entire spin of the lens. So that, that saves yeah. seconds, but little things like that. And then after you put the lens on, you basically go into the, I don't know how familiar you are 
with these uh, Preston hand units, you'll have to go in and pick a lens, set it to infinity, hit enter, and then the lens is calibrated. So the markings on the, <coughs> on the uh, hand, handset correspond with the markings there, as well as the markings on the iris. The DP has a miniature version of this. Those will also correspond. The nice thing about the Preston is you only have to input them once. Yeah. But you have to do with the lenses because the lens needs to know the full cycle of the lens. Of the motor. The nice thing is, the nice thing is it, knows it, it knows it once you tell it. The problem is you've got to tell it everything. So yes. you have to just once. Minimum focus. focus. And that's strictly to, to speed up the rotation of the motor. I mean, we're literally talking seconds, but if we're doing, you know, I'll say hand it to me at minimum because a lot of shows are now shooting primes solely and mm -hmm. instead of zooms. With zooms, you'll be sitting on it all day, so you only have to do it once. But, oh, 105, you know, let's go to the 75. You know, I'll go to the 100. And every time you do it, it, it's always important to have lenses very close. It's the closest cart. And so we're constantly handing off, and we want to slap on, boom, you know, all basically you're waiting for 10 seconds for the motors to rotate and then another five seconds for me to dial in. And usually if I'm, you know, putting this on, my seconds grabbing this and getting this going into the sub menu to, to set up this and basically hands it to me, I set it to boom, go. So you want to be as quick as you can with that kind of stuff. At least for us, that's an important yeah. part of it. So once again, as a utility, I mean, it's nice to know that, nice to know where the lenses are, what kind of lens. So you can hand that to the first. The other exactly. nice thing about the Light Ranger is it will calculate your depth of field. So if you tell it what lens you're on at what stop, it will, and then you give it 10 feet, it'll tell you down here. So at 28 feet, five inches, it, uh, if, and this is, so that's this the is 100% calibrated, right? But no. it's telling me I've got from 27.9 to 29.2. Yeah, so you'll be able to play your helps. splits. Yeah. If two actors are set up, you'll use that to sometimes, uh, it's relative. Again, every trust, you, you know, but verify everything's by eye. Yeah. And then sometimes you'll be on a super tight lens and it'll be like, it'll be 10 feet and it'll say 10 feet to 10 feet. And yeah. you know, okay, I got to pay attention on this one, you know. So, and the nice thing about the zooms also is as the operator is zooming in, it will recalculate. Can't you program all the lenses that you have on the show into the light ranger? Into the handset. You do the, you do the handset. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The handset's and you can actually now, uh, wirelessly or Bluetooth, they have an adapter you could transfer from one ha handset to another. So I, no. I, you know, we own, own gear like this, so we don't have to, but commonly at preps, you'll, you'll have to put the lenses in or you do it on the fly. You know, you do it as the lens comes up real quick. Sorry, sorry. The first time, you know, it takes, it's 10 points, but we've done it so, so no. maybe it takes 30 seconds to, to put it in for us. And that's also something you would do at prep. We, yeah. at prep, get everything yeah, as, we, as we're checking the lenses, we're also inputting them, inputting the stops and all that stuff. So it's kind of a, and then you move on to the next lens and you might have 20 lenses. So it takes some time and you don't want to be in the middle of the set. Sometimes it happens, but you don't want to be, you know, doing it on the fly. Are there any like hard fast rules you're kind of thinking of when you're, um, as you're like doing that like, precision shot or a full, or like a full back shot? For me, I, I, I think when I first move in, I think very commonly assistants over pull they they feel like they have to be constantly moving. And, and you do to a point with an actor if they're 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 moving back and forth. Um, I, I think like on a walk up or something, I it, it's never good to like chase it. Like if someone's walking towards you and you're pulling focus and you're behind them, it, it's almost better to like save the shot by jumping ahead, letting them catch up, and then trying again. Or if you're in, especially if you're in front of them and then you go backwards, then you go, you shoot past them and all of a sudden you get focused jumping. It's almost better to be like, okay, hopefully they won't use this whole shot. They want a part of it. And you have to also remember that, that any assistant who tells you they don't, haven't had a soft, soft shot is either <laughs> lying or they haven't been doing it long enough because every assistant will. And you're never going to get everything in focus. It's, I, I don't know anyone. I'd love to meet the assistant who says that. You know, and especially today, the way they shoot. So one of the rules is I always play it on the closer side. Depth of field will always be deeper on the end. So if it's at 10 feet, you may carry to 10.6, but you'll only have 9.10 or 9.9 on the front. So it's always better to be a little bit ahead of someone, hoping you catch them on the back end. Obviously, you want them perfectly in focus, but you always have more on the, on the back end. And again, people may disagree completely 
with me on that, but I, I find that just, just okay, reset and don't over pull. And those are the toughest shots. And, you, and it just takes, like I said, it just takes practice and you know as it getting closer, you know, you're going to lens and like this is like 30 to 20, but from like 7 to 8 could be like that. And don't beat yourself up too. Yeah. It, it's a lot of people, I know people have tried it and then said, I'm not, it's too stressful. Um, you want to give them your best and you will get better. And, and, but you also have to know, you, you have to know in an editing standpoint that we walk someone up on a 50 or 17 mil and a 35 mil, and then we do a close up and they're like, oh yeah, we'll just walk them in on the hundred. They're not going to use the hundred. Uh, they, you want to give them the option to, but you know that that's usually once they land and start talking. So you, you have to know where, where an editor is going to save you and stuff like that. And you can go to the DP like, I missed him for a step. And most times the DP is like, no, we start on the wide shot. So you know, have an idea on how. Some, some shows will be like, no, we want it. Oh, we're going to take him in on 100 all the way. Be like, OK. But, but uh, just know that, that most of the time, they're looking for a certain point. Lens, I mean, technically, if I had two of these, they should be identical. But there's always play in a barrel. There's difference in, in, like, I use a certain type of motor. Jason prefers another type. So that'll make a difference. Um, you can, if I, if I show up on set with my same, you know, motors and my same handset, most of the time, and again, having it align off, if it's, you know, nine foot six, and, and you're showing nine foot five, there is an, sometimes an acceptable, you know, gray area. Obviously you want, I don't know any lens that comes up perfectly all the way through the spectrum, especially when you get to the closed stuff. You know, who's to say, it, they don't map out every inch on this. And there's also, I don't know if it's a digital slippage and how, you know, these, these motors over time will wear out. So little things will change, but for the most part it holds. I think it holds up, these hold up to 275 different lenses. Good question. I think uh, sharing your vision of what you want, just like we would talk with a DP. Um, after doing it this long, I have no problem coming up to a director, coming up to you and, and asking, hey, for the first take, do you want to keep focus here? I mean, there's only so much uh, artistically we can help you with. But uh, like I said, communicating and say, do you want to play focus on first take on this actor, second take on this, and then third take, do you want to play dialogue? What are you envisioning in the editing room? How are you going to cut this? Do you want to see the racks? Do you want the DP to make them even more drastic by opening the camera up? Stuff like that. Um, so sharing what your, what your vision is, you know, as far as focus can, you could draw someone's attention to things very subtly with focus. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a creative thing, but I could pull someone's interest to someone just by drifting focus off, off to something like that. And so, so I think communicating with them is, is, I favor it. I think that's great, the more information I get. You know, do what you did, that was great. Or, you know, I like the rollouts at the end of a shot or something like that. So that, that's And don't good. be an asshole. Yes. And that, also learn, learn the jargon and the terms that we use because yeah. it'll help you communicate better instead of, you know, if you want a piece of equipment or a lens size or, you know, how the shot wants to work. Yeah. You know, just learn how we communicate and just it'll help you. With, you're talking to the operator, you're talking, you know. Respect for how hard it can be for us, yeah. too. Yeah. I think that's, you know, if, if you're a long lens, at wide open, and it takes us two, three takes to get it, I, I think, you know, there has to be some understanding that, that it's, you know, I, I've, go ahead, you try. <laughs> 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 like, I don't want to direct. <laughs> so.